live from um, my backyard. This is in the heart of the Cascade Mountains. So what we're going to do today is we're going to read some stories. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself before we get going. I published a book of my poetry um, a couple years back through Uttered Chaos Press. Uh, my book is called Sweet Grass Talking. And my publisher asked me last year, uh, what about book two? And so I've been working on that. And on Friday, I submitted my manuscript for book two. It's going to be titled Have War Paint, Will Travel. And that'll be available uh, later this year from Uttered Chaos Press. It'll also be available through Amazon and Barnes and Noble, where you can also find my first book, Sweetgrass Talking. So my next project, um, now that I finished submitting that one to a publisher, is that I am working with my sister, Suzanne Hardo, on a book of poetry. And I hope you guys would um, watch for this. It's going to be really interesting. We're taking the same title and we're each writing to that title. And our poems are going to be side by side with the same title, but different perspectives. My hands look gigantic, gigantic hands. No. So anyways, that's what we're going to do. That's the next project that I have. But speaking of writing and reading, let's talk about a little boy's big moment. This is from the Indian reading series. This one uh, features the art of Marvin Tailfeathers. It's written by Joan Kennerly, Carmen Marceau, Doris Oldperson, and June Tatsy. And this was put together um, in, as a reading series for stories and legends of the Northwest. I thought you guys would really enjoy this. So Little Boy's Big Moment is a story about a small Blackfeet Indian boy's first dance. It's traditional with our Blackfeet Indian people to have a giveaway ceremony to honor someone for something special. When a child or a person makes their first public appearance as a dancer, this ceremony is done to honor the person. The person will then be recognized as a dancer in our Blackfeet Indian society. This ceremony is still carried out to a great degree among traditional Blackfeet Indian people. Okay, so here's the picture. One cold winter evening, young rabbit's father was sitting by the wood stove. He was singing a fast grass dance song. The little boy thought, this song makes me want to dance. Young rabbit began slowly tapping his foot to the beat of the drum. He then got up and began to dance very fast. At the end of the song, the father said to his son, young rabbit, do you like to dance? Yes, father, it makes me feel good, said young rabbit. Teach me how to do fancy steps, he asked. Young rabbit, said his father, at the big dance this year, we will have a giveaway in honor of the first time you dance at a celebration. We will give away many fine presents, some blankets, Indian crafts, and some fine horses. The son listened to his father and felt very proud of this honor. How grown up he felt. Young Rabbit's mother and father began making a good fancy dance outfit. Just the right colored feathers were chosen. A fine porcupine headdress was made. Bells were strung on rawhide. After several months of work, Young Rabbit tried on his outfit. He felt great pride. I feel like a great Blackfeet brave, he said. Many evenings, Young Rabbit danced his new steps. His mother their many blankets. She made some star quilts and put them away for the big dance. His father broke many horses for the giveaway. At the campground, the teepee was pitched among the other teepees in a big circle. Everyone is happy to be together again after a long, cold winter. After two days passed, it was time for Young Rabbit's big moment. Look, he's just waking up right there. It's like some of you look in the morning stretching, yawning, your parents telling you to get out of bed. Young Rabbit's mother and father brought all the blankets, the moccasins, and beadwork to the ring. Young Rabbit stood proudly beside them. Each drum sounded loud and clear as the drummers sang the grass dance songs. 
What nice costumes the dancers had. The bells tinkled happily and the feathers swayed as the dancers moved in, this, in their beautiful regalia. The people laughed and joked. They were very happy. Suddenly, the announcer said, the family of young rabbit will now have an honor dance. This will be the first time young rabbit will dance at a big celebration. Young rabbit's heart pounded as his father and mother walked with him to the center of the ring. Young rabbit danced proudly as he led the, the line. His mother and fo father followed behind him. Many relatives and friends joined in the dance. The drumbeat seemed to say to young rabbit, how proud we are of you. You are a strong, wonderful Indian boy. Someday you will lead our tribe to great honors. Then the drum stopped. Young rabbit's father and mother began the giveaway. He thought, how very lucky I am to be a black Indian. I'm so very proud. And to think my ancestors have roamed this very land. When the giveaway was over, the family left the center of the dance ring. They were overjoyed to think that the great spirit had helped them obtain enough to give to others in honor of their son. They felt great, achieve, a great satisfaction to know this chat task had been achieved. Young Rabbit was now recognized as one of the dancers. When the drums began to beat and the dancers started to dance, Young Rabbit joined in. The drums seemed to say, Young Rabbit dances so proudly. Young Rabbit dances so lightly. Young Rabbit is truly a great Indian dancer. Young Rabbit danced for many, many hours. He became so very tired. His eyes wanted to close. His legs would not move as fast as the drum beat. Even his headdress seemed tired. It hung slowly to one side. Young Rabbit's mother looked at the tired little boy and smiled. She took his hand in hers. They walked slowly toward the teepee. Although very tired, Young Rabbit had completed a great event. Young Rabbit's mother cooked a meat of boiled meat, cooked a meal of boiled meat, berry soup, and fry bread. How yummy does that look? After Young Rabbit had eaten, he fell into a deep, happy sleep inside the comfortable teepee. The next morning, a happy family left for home. The end. That's a good story. And we're about to have another one from the same reading series. This is level one, book two, How Wild Horses Were Captured. And this one was put together by members of the Warm Springs Reservation Committee and illustrated by William Frank, among others. Okay, this is the story of a horse roundup. Are you ready? Okay, I'm gonna turn my chair, hang on one second. Okay, here we go. Thank you for tuning in, I'm glad you're here. Horses have been on this land for many, many years. Long ago, there were many, many horses. Horses are lots of different colors. Some are black, brown, white, or gray. Some are two colors. Some are spotted. Can you think of more? A long time ago, the fathers and uncles and big brothers would go out in the spring to catch the wild horses. They built new trap corrals out of poles from juniper, fir, or willow trees. Then dried trees were cut down and put in a row near the gate of the corral. These were called wing lines. After that was finished, the older men went out to start the wild herds of horses toward the corral. The younger men and boys were told to hide behind trees and rocks. These people were called the shortstops. When the wild horses came galloping through, the shortstops came out from their hiding places to help turn the wild horses toward the trap corral. Sometimes the horses got away. Then the men would go out again after the horses. This time, they would ch trace, chase the horses to the trap corral and right in through the gate of the corral. 
after the horses had been captured, they were separated. The horses that had owners were branded. Some were tied up to be taken home later. All the young boys who took part in the wild horse chase were given a young colt. How exciting. The boys were to take care of the colt, train it, and break it for riding. The horses were all kinds and sizes. There were good ones and mean ones. That is how wild horses were captured long ago. Today, the chase is about the same. The corrals are more modern. They use wires for the corrals and wing lines are also wired. Saddles are used today. Long ago, they did not have saddles or bridles and braided hair and rawhide strings were used for halters. There are still many wild horses. The young colts when caught are still given to the young boys who give the colts names. So I hope that you enjoy that one. We're next going to read one of my favorites. It's called The Button Blanket. Okay, are you ready? This is the front of the book by Nan McNutt, designed and illustrated by Yosu Osawa. Um, the Northwest Coast Art is by Nancy Dawson. Anne had danced before at home. She wore her baby blanket. Grandpa and Dad would sing. First, Anne would turn gently one way, and then she would turn the other. That was how Mom and Grandma danced. There will be a celebration, a potlatch, said Grandma. Some of our important people will receive Quaquiatl names. Some people, like you, will dance for the first time. Everyone will be at the big house. It's time you have a button blanket. Anne dreamed about her new button blanket with a special crest. But who will make my special crest, thought Anne. At the store, Mom bought some dark blue wool. It felt soft and warm to Anne. Mom had also bought some bright red wool for Anne's special crest. Will Uncle make my crest? asked Anne. Anne looked at the buttons. I don't know if you can see them. They're down here in this big jar uh, made from shells. She turned them in her fingers. The buttons felt smooth and cold. They sparkled with rainbow colors as she moved them. Then Anne counted 300 buttons for her button blanket. When Mom and Anne got home, Grandma measured and cut the wool. It hung over Anne's shoulders. The sides of the wool touched her hands. Anne played with the wool between her fingers. She thought about dancing in her new button blanket. Now stand still, said Grandma. She measured the wool. Grandma smiled. Just right, she said. Grandma sewed the red trim around three sides. Anne watched the needle go up, then down, up, then down. Will Uncle make my crest? asked Anne. Grandma stopped the sewing machine. You'd better go ask, Grandma said. Anne found Uncle outside. He was carving a mask for the potlatch. He would wear it when he danced. How's your button blanket coming, asked Uncle. He set aside his ads and mask down beside him. It needs my special crest, answered Anne. Would you make my crest? I thought you'd never ask her uncle replied with a smile. With pencil and paper, Uncle drew out the crest. With pins and scissors, Mom cut it out of red wool. With needle and thread, Grandma sewed the, dark, the red crest on the dark blue blanket. Then Anne pulled out the bag of 300 shiny buttons. And one by one, Grandma helped her sew the buttons on her new button blanket. The time for the potlatch finally came. Everyone was there. Grandma, Grandpa, Mom, Dad, Uncle, and Baby Brother were at the big house, too. And Anne danced for the first time. Look how beautiful. When Anne's uncle drew her crest, she learned about some of the basic shapes in Northwest Coast Indian art. The first shape was the U-form. You need paste, salt, or cornmeal. And the figure. So you spread the paste on the U, you sprinkle salt or cornmeal over U, and leave it out to dry. Then you shake off the extra cornmeal or salt. This is a U form. You need a color crayon, scissors, you color the U, you cut out the U, and you save it. 
Here's another U. You need a crayon and scissors. You cut the U after you color it. And now how many U's do you have? You, to make a stack of U's, you need paste, a color crayon, two U's. Looks like three to me. What do you think? Paste them down and color the remaining U's. Now, the second shape Anne learned about from her uncle was called an ovoid. It looked like this. So here's another ovoid that you can color and cut out. You can look at and you can make. The inside piece, the inner ovoid, is called that because it sits inside the larger ovoid. Now, to do a diving whale's tail, look at that. You match up the forms, you color them, and you paste them down. And now, you can, from this design, from this book, you can learn how to make a button blanket design with a whale head. Now here it shows you the ovoids, uh, different form line design that all go together to make this beautiful design. And here are the parts for the whale's head. So if you want to make a button blanket for a paper, a paper doll, here's how to do it. That's also in these instructions. And you can make a dancing paper person. Can you see that? That's pretty awesome. So there's also in the back of this book, there's a teaching guide of how to make a button blanket and um, how to do music and movement. This is a really good book for children and for adults. It also won an award. So that was pretty nice and exciting. The next book that we're going to read is called The Maiden of Deception Pass. And this is about the, about the guardian of her Samish people. This storybook is dedicated by Samish Tribal Council to the ancestors of Samish, whose breath lives on in the retelling of our stories by present and future generations of our people. Published by the Samish Indian Nation Tribal Council. Illustrations by Roger Fernandez, Elwa Klalam. And I'm happy to say a friend of mine. So, this one starts with um, greetings from the chairman. Let me share that with you. I am pleased and proud of the Samish Indian Nation's ability to share this important story that so many of our people have kept alive and well for many generations. Although our oral traditions are fading with time and the loss of our elders, this story survives. It should be told and read out loud to help preserve the great tradition of oral history where this story and others originated. The importance of this story cannot be overstated when we look to the world around us. Global warming is a reality and the dangers of sea level rise and acidification of the Salish Sea is influencing all life below and above the high water mark. It is our hope that by sharing this story with our next generations, we can all understand that it is time for all of us to curb and reduce our carbon footprint due to the overuse of fossil fuels. With that message in mind, please enjoy this story and share it with your families. Please remember where it comes from, why it is told and retold for generations, and why it is a story that must be continued to be told. Our hope is that our maiden of deception past will be remembered forever, helping future generations to guide and protect our Salish Sea for time immemorial. Haishka CM. Thank you, respected one. Thomas Wooten, Chairman, Samish Indian Nation. Brian, can you bring me a glass of water, please? Thank you. Okay. A long time ago, in a Samish village by Deception Pass, along the waters of the Salish Sea, there li lived a young maiden named Kokwal Alwut. Her father was head man of the village, and she was respected by her Samish people for her generosity, hard work, and kindness. One day, Kokwal Alut and other young maidens were at the beach near their village, gathering shellfish and digging clams. She was wading in the water, and as she reached for a shellfish, it slipped from her grasp and moved deeper into the water. She followed the shellfish, 
but it continued to move deeper into the water still. As she waded deeper into the water, something brushed her leg. She looked down and saw the face of a man under the water looking at her. She left the water frightened, but also curious as to who this man might be. The next day, she returned to gather shellfish by the sea, waded into the water, and once again saw the man looking up at her. The handsome young man rose out of the water and spoke to her. Do not be afraid, he said. I come from a village beneath the sea, where I am the ruler of all the creatures that live under the sea. Thank you. The king of all the sea creatures told Kokwalk Alut, I have been watching you and love listening to your beautiful voice. I have come to ask you to marry me and live with my family under the sea. I can use my special power so you will be able to live forever below with all my sea relations. Kokwal Awut was in awe of this strong and handsome young man from beneath the sea. They went back to the village to ask permission from her parents to marry, but the people felt a great coldness before he arrived and were frightened upon seeing the stranger from the deep. Oh, look at their beautiful longhouses. Look at that. You can see their canoes too, huh? The king of all the sea creatures introduced himself, explained his high status, and asked to marry Kokwal Alut. He promised to keep her safe underwater. No, said her father. You may not marry our daughter. She will die. No, I cannot allow it. Her father was worried, wasn't he? The king of all the sea creatures told her parents that he could make her immortal and able to live underwater, but still they refused. He became angry and said, if you don't allow us to marry, I will take away everything. I will take away the fish and the shellfish. I will take away the fresh water you drink. He left the village and returned to the sea. True to his word, the people saw the fresh water in the streams vanish and the berries dried up. This is very sad. The young man returned and was given permission to marry Ko Kual Alwut. The parents had only one condition. Ko Kual Alwut must return once every year to visit her people to let them know she was happy and well cared for. He used his powers so she could breathe underwater and then she left her village and followed her husband into the sea. The people saw her go deeper and deeper into the water until all they saw was her long hair flowing in the water. The fishermen began catching fish again, and the beaches teemed with clams and other shellfish. Berries thrived, and the streams flowed with clean, clear water. Look at all that salmon drying next to their um, cookhouse, longhouse. Kokwala whoop returned once a year to visit her family and her people. The first year, people saw that seaweed and kelp and seagrass was growing in her hair. Can you see that? Her hair is all green. By the second year, barnacles and limpets and mussels grew on her arms. By the third year, even scales began to form on her skin. The fourth year, barnacles were now growing on her once beautiful face, and she was nearly covered with scales. Coke. Paul Alu spent her time alone gazing out to sea, and the family grew concerned. The fourth year, the parents spoke to each other and finally said, Kokwal Alu, we know you belong with your family under the sea. That place is now your home, and we can see you are not happy here anymore. We release you from the promise. You no longer need to return to visit us unless you wish. She thanked her parents for their love and understanding. She said, I promise there will always be fish in the sea to catch, plenty of shellfish to gather on the beaches, and lots of fresh water to drink. This I promise you. Then Kokwal Alwut returned to her home beneath the water. To this day, the Samish people know she is there, providing abundance for them. Kokwal Alwut sacrificed her human form to live in the sea. Because of her, there has always been plenty of fish, shellfish, and clean spring water at Deception Pass. Many relatives of Kokwal Alwut live in the area 
and some tell of feeling her presence when they are on the water. The long flowing strands of eelgrass visible in the past today represent her long flowing hair and are a reminder of her continued presence. So her story is told in the following oral histories, The Maiden of Deception Pass, as told by Charlie Edwards, Samish, 1938, Story of Deception Pass, a lower Skagit story recorded by ethnologist Sally Snyder in the 1950s, The Maiden of Deception Pass, as told by Victor Underwood, Underwood Samish, um, in 1984. Her story is also told in 2015 documentary, the Maiden of Deception Pass, Guardian of Her Samish People by Longhouse Media. So I hope that someday you'll get to visit Deception Pass and maybe you'll get to visit the beautiful story pole that's featured there. It was carved by Tracy Powell and installed in 1983 at Rosario Beach in Deception Pass State Park. It was created under the guidance of Laura Skyquai Edwards, Linda Day, Mary Hansen, and Ken Hansen. On one side, it depicts Ko Kuala Wut as a young woman. The other side depicts her as she began her transformation. She holds a large salmon and stands as a reminder of her sacrifice to ensure the well-being of her people. Isn't that a beautiful story? And how are we doing on time? We're doing great on time. Talk, I'm asking a question and I'm answering my own question. So I'm going to pause and I'll take a drink of water. And I hope that you all are um, enjoying what we're providing here today with Native Wellness Institute and our ongoing Native Power Hour. So super excited to share all that with you. So this story is The Girl Who Loved Wild Horses. Story and illustrations are by Paul Goebel. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's have another story. The people were always moving from place to place following the herds of buffalo. They had many horses to carry the teepees and all their belongings. They trained their fastest horses to hunt the buffalo. There was a girl in the village who loved horses. She would often get up at daybreak when the birds were singing about the rising sun. She led the horses to drink at the river. She spoke softly and they followed. People noticed that she understood horses in a special way. She knew which grass they liked best and where to find them shelter from the winter blizzards. If a horse was hurt, she looked after it. Every day when she had helped her mother carry water and collect firewood, she would run off to be with the horses. She stayed with them in the meadows, but was careful never to go beyond sight of home. One hot day when the sun was overhead, she felt sleepy. She spread her blanket and lay down. It was nice to hear the horses eating and moving slowly among the flowers. Soon she fell asleep. A faint rumble of distant thunder did not waken her. Angry clouds began to roll out across the sky with lightning flashing in the darkness beneath. But the fresh breeze and scent of rain made her sleep soundly. Suddenly, there was a flash of lightning, a crash and rumbling which shook the earth. The girl leapt to her feet in fright. Everything was awake. Horses were rearing up on their hind legs and snorting in terror. She grabbed a horse's mane and jumped on his back. In an instant, the herd was galloping away like the wind. She called to the horses to stop, but her voice was lost in the thunder. Nothing could stop them. She hugged her horse's neck with her fingers twisted into his mane. She clung on, afraid of following under, falling under the drumming hooves. The horses galloped faster and faster, pursued by thunder and lightning. They swept like a brown flood across hills and through valleys. Fear drove them on and on, leaving their familiar grazing grounds far behind. At last, the storm disappeared over the horizon. The tired horses slowed and then stopped and rested. Stars came out and the moon shone over hills the girl had never seen before. She knew they were lost. Next morning, she was awakened by a loud neighing. A beautiful spotted stallion was prancing to and fro in front of her, stomping his hooves and shaking his mane. 
He was strong and proud and more handsome than any horse she had ever dreamed of. He told her that he was the leader of all the wild horses who roamed the hills. He welcomed her to live with them. She was glad, and her horses lifted their heads and neighed joyfully, happy to be free with the wild horses. The people searched everywhere for the girl and the vanished horses. They were nowhere to be found. But a year later, two hunters rode into the hills where the wild horses lived. When they climbed a hill and looked over the top, they saw the wild horses led by the beautiful spotted stallion. Beside him rode the girl leading a colt. They called out to her. She waved back, but the stallion quickly drove her away with all his horses. The hunters galloped home and told what they had seen. The men mounted their fastest horses and set out at once. It was a long chase. The stallion defended the girl and the colt. He circled around and around them so that the dry riders could not get near. They tried to catch him with ropes, but he dodged them. He had no fear. His eyes shone like cold stars. He snorted and his hooves struck as fast as lightning. The riders admired his courage. They might never have caught the girl except her horse stumbled and she fell. She was glad to see her parents and she thought they would be happy. They thought she would be happy to be home again. But they soon saw she was sad and missed her, the colt, and the wild horses. Each evening as the sun went down, people would hear the stallion neighing sadly from the hilltop above the village, calling for her to come back. The days passed. Her parents knew the girl was lonely. She became ill and doctors could do nothing to help her. They asked what would make her well again. I love to run with the wild horses, she answered. They are my relatives. If you let me go back to them, I shall be happy evermore. Her parents loved her and agreed that she should go back to live with the wild horses. They gave her a beautiful dress and the best horse in the village to ride. The spotted stallion led his wild horses down from the hills. The people gave them fine things to wear, colorful blankets and decorated saddles. They painted designs on their bodies and tied eagle feathers and ribbons in their manes and tails. In return, the girl gave the colt to her parents. Everyone was joyful. Once again, the girl rode beside the spotted stallion. They were proud and happy together, but she did not forget her people. Each year, she would come back, and she always brought her parents a colt. And then one year, she did not return and was never seen again. But when hunters next saw the wild horses, their gallop beside the mighty stallion, a beautiful mare with a mane and tail floating like wispy clouds about her. They said the girl had surely become one of the wild horses at last. Today, we are still glad to remember that we have relatives among the horse people, and it gives us joy to see the wild horses running free. Our thoughts fly with them. That's a good story, isn't it? We just love that one. So we're going to read some more because we have an hour. Isn't that exciting? It's nice to spend a little bit of time with you. Thank you for tuning in. And this video will be available on Native Wellness Institute's Facebook page. Um, so anytime you want to come back and read it, you can. So this book is called Say a Song by Ron Hershey and illustrated by Constance Burgum. And this book was um, made possible in part by a grant to the Port Gamble Squalum Tribe from the National Park Service Historic Preservation Grants to Indian Tribes for the purpose of language preservation. Ron Hershey grew up on Nucleate Bay in Washington State and worked as a biologist for Port Gamble Squalum Tribe. When grandmother and grandfather were young, Sklalem words were with us like the wind, the song of birds and the swirl of the tide. Our voices were the only human sound, gentle and kind, yet strong voices that were one with the seasons of salmon and cedar. Today I walk along the morning stream on my path down to the sea. I hear the sounds of Sklalem words grandmother Sia taught me. Baby salmon, quichin, 
swim along a path all their own. They wiggle up from the stream gravel where they are born in early spring. Then they begin a long journey within mossy mat- shadows of fallen logs and towering cedar chai trees. So I have to apologize. I don't speak slalom, so I'm doing the best I can um, with the words that I that I don't recognize. So if I mispronounce them, it's not on purpose. Uh, but you know what? In our, our Cheyenne language, we say if somebody mispronounces something, that's okay. At least they're trying. So the tiny fi- silver fish swim through beavers, skio, pond, where heron, sihu, and otter, scottel, hunt with keen eyes. The old cedar trees shelter the baby fish, just as Saya protects me and my friends. Salmon berries, alelo, ripen in the sun, so shots as summer draws near. The purple flowers blossom like stars, tetosina, along the riverbank. Isn't that beautiful? Some of the blossoms drop into the water, swirling downstream, where they settle in quiet pools. The baby salmon swim downstream, too, into the marshy shallows of the bay. Here is where we gather sweet-smelling grass for baskets, mohoi, to hold our blackberries, koyanga, soapberries, tswasum, and mussels, klatsum, too. Before they journey out to sea, Satso, the salmon leap and splash in the Quiet Bay. We ride our bikes or hike into the foothills, way up where the bare grass grows in the shadows of Mount Olympus. Mapchikton. Did you see that cute little kite? Look at that. How cool is that little kite? I want one just like it. Okay, let's turn the page see what happens next oh beautiful as the sun warms the beach coquengo we hike down to swim in the bay where paddlers ride in our cedar canoes soyuro Saya says a young man switches once called the orca whales kumachin here they swam together from far from shore and back again the late summer tides sweep out like a great blanket covers, then uncovers clams, quahawk, cockles, tlitlum, and crabs. Achehe, tucked in the sand and seaweed tangles. We dig the clams and catch the crabs, then gather for a clam bake on the beach. When south wind sautunsel blows and maple leaves turn golden in the first crisp mornings of fall, my father, Soot, hunts the elk. Smiths. Do you have elk hunters in your family? I have elk hunters in my family. Now, adult salmon, Tukwaxlan, turn back from the sea. They swim toward the streams of their birth, returning to our rivers whose names seem to sing the salmon home. Poco, Elwa, Dungeness, Kosin, Dos Wallops, Duckabush, Skokomish. Eagle, Kwaegson, waits as she has for many centuries past. Our people wait, too. We catch the salmon in our nets. Smoked salmon, a scotch, will last all winter long. We dance. Kwaegson, and stars come out in the nighttime sky, like families gathering for our winter celebration. I listen to the drums, watch the masked dancers, and eat the best of berry pies. My voice sings strong, grows strong as I sing the squalum words I learned on my walks with my Saya. Then I sleep and dream of the seasons past. Starlight and shadows dance in my mind, and the words of Saya's songs, Skio, Scottle, and Klumachin, swim with the tiny salmon, resting in the river, waiting for a new spring. Oh, look in the back. It tells me how to pronounce all these words. Adult salmon, tuckwaklon, basket, mohoi, beach, coquengo, beaver, skio. I was pretty close on that one. Blackberries, kiganga, canoe, soyuto, 
cedar, tschi, clams, quok, cockles, st, lam, crabs, ach, dance, koi, ishen, eagle, quank, sun. Those are really fascinating words. What a great way to learn language. So, let's read another book from the learning series, the Indian reading series. This series came out a long time ago, and it was a collection of authentic material cooperatively developed by Indian people from 12 reservations. The Pacific Northwest Indian Reading and Language Development Program Policy Board members were Warren Clements from Warm Springs, Maury Jimenez from Klamath, Joan Kennerly from Blackfeet, Walter Moffat from Nez Perce, Emmett Oliver from Quinault, Bob Parsley from Chippewa, Lloyd Smith, Warm Springs, Max Snow, and Jeannie Thomas from Yakima. So this is Chipmunk Meat the old witch are you ready here we go in the days of long ago when animals were people there lived an old lady squirrel old lady squirrel had a grandson chipmunk whom she loved very much old lady squirrel and chipmunk lived along a small river called hood river they lived right at the place where hood river flowed into a big river called columbia river Old Grandmother Squirrel and her grandson lived by themselves in a small village, but someone was always kind enough to bring them something to eat. In the spring, someone would bring them salmon. In the fall, when hunting was good, someone would bring them venison, and sometimes Beaver was kind enough to bring them an eel. Old Grandmother Squirrel would prepare the salmon and venison for winter. She dried and pounded it into pemmican to be stored away for winter days, cold winter days. Grandmother Squirrel taught Chipmunk how to gather hazelnuts and seeds. When Chipmunk went into the hills to gather the nuts, Grandmother Squirrel would warn Chipmunk not to go too far from home. There was an old witch at at Atia who liked to eat children. Ah! Scary. Little Chipmunk was a playful Chipmunk. One day, while he was out playing and gathering nuts, he wandered too far from home. At at Atia, the old witch saw Chipmunk and chased him. He ran as fast as he could, but she could run just as fast and was gaining on him. Chipmunk ran and ran until he came to a tree. He had just started to climb the tree when the old witch grabbed at him. She missed, but she scratched his back with her long fingers. Chipmunk was frightened. He stayed in his safe place in the tree. That's a good idea, huh? Stay away from bad people. At last, at at Atia left. Chipmunk climbed down the tree and ran home to Grandmother Squirrel. Look at his back. To this day, you can see Chipmunk playing while gathering nuts and seeds for winter. Because he would not mind his Grandmother Squirrel, Chipmunk will always have the marks on his back from at at Atia's long fingers. That's why we have to listen to our elders. They tell us these things for good reason to protect us. Okay. <coughs> this one is called Birds and People. It's level one, book two. This story was told to the author by his grandfather. This, this is a crow story written and illustrated by Henry Realbird. My children, come here. On this ground, there are many kinds of birds. There are many colors. There are some small and some large. Birds have nests uh, or homes in many places. Some nests are on trees. Some are in. Uh, some nests are on trees. Some are in trees. Some nests are on the ground, some are in the ground. Still other birds have their nests on top of rocks where it is difficult for enemies to reach. Eagles and hawks can fly way up high. They look for mice, rabbits, weasels, and other small animals to eat. Birds of this type eat things that are alive and that they have to kill. They're hunters. 
Robins and meadowlarks can turn fast and fly close to the ground. They look for seeds, worms, and bugs to eat. Ducks and geese can fly high and for a long ways. These birds are usually near water. They go underwater to eat grasses and roots. They also eat fruits and seeds. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Crows, magpies, and jays can fly high or low. They eat meat, seeds, or roots. They are thieves and steal dry meat and dry salmon, so you have to watch out for them. Where each bird sits in a tree is different. The hawk sits at the top of the tree. When it wants to fly, it jumps up, then flies away during the day. It can act like a kite and have no weight. See, here's a treetop. He jumps up, and then he flies, and then he flies away. Where each bird sits in a tree is different. The owl sits at the side of the tree. When it wants to fly, it jumps off, then flies away at the end of the day. Its stomach must feel like it's coming out of its mouth. See? Side of the tree, and then it jumps down, and then flies and fly away. The sage hen has a large and long body. When it flies, first it flutters and wobbles for a while, then quits and glides for a while, then flutters and wobbles again. Not, not very efficient, but it works for the sage. Little sage hen. The hawk doesn't tell the owl it's going to break its neck because of its takeoff. The owl doesn't tell the hawk it might break its neck because it glides up way too high. The sage hen doesn't tell the chickadee not to twist and turn because it is too close to the ground. The chickadee doesn't tell the sage hen not to wobble when it flies. These birds fly the way they know how. They whistle the way they know how. They eat what they know and can get. Each bird has its own way of doing things. Each bird has its own color of feathers. See how the duck goes under the water to get food and the hawk grabs fish from within the water? These birds are almost like Indians. There are many kinds of Indian tribes. They are not all the same. They do things differently. All birds fly differently, but they fly. All Indian tribes live differently, but they live. The Lummi, Skokomish, Muckleshoot, and other Indian tribes live near the water or ocean. They use boats and travel on water. They eat a lot of fish, clams, oysters, crabs, and lobsters. The Lummi speak their own language. The Skokomish speak their own language. The Muckleshoot speak their own language. All the others speak their own language. These are the coast Indians. Can you see them? Maka, Ozet, Koyute, Ho, Quinault, Skokomish, Showalter, Chehalis, Nisqually, Pialup, Muckleshoot, Tulalip, Sunamish, Lummi, Jamestown, Klaalam, Sox Rattles are over here, and there are many other tribes in this area. The Umatilla and Nez Perce. Oh, the Stillaguamish are in here too, over on this side. Um, Warm Springs, Yakima, and other Indian tribes live between the coast and plains. They eat a lot of fish and deer. Warm Springs speak their own language. The Nez Perce speak their own language. The Yakima speak their own language. All the others speak their own language. These are the Plateau Indians. Oh, there's the Colville. Coeur d'Alene, Nez Perce, Shoshone Bannock. Burns Paiute, Paiute, Wasco, Warm Springs, Umatilla, Flathead, Wyoming. Here's Montana. Far away from the ocean and large rivers are the Plains Indians. These are the Blackfeet, Sioux, Crow, Cheyenne, and other Indian tribes. <clears throat> These Indians eat a lot of buffalo, deer, and antelope. They don't eat a lot of fish. The Blackfeet speak their own language. The Sioux speak their own language. The crows speak their own language. The Cheyennes speak their own language. All the others speak their own language. 
These are Plains Indians. All birds do not look or sound alike. All Indians do not sound or look alike. Most Crow Indians sound and look about the same. That is how it is. All people look about the same. Although some make a different sound, they do things the way they know how. There you go. That was an interesting story. I hope you enjoyed that. And I think we have time for one more. One more story. How Cottontail Lost His Fingers. This is from the same um, Indian reading series, Stories and Legends of the Northwest. And this is copyrighted by the Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs Reservation of Oregon. When Cottontail was small, he was a very naughty boy. He would not do as he was told. One day as Cottontail was looking for clover, he wandered away from the camp. Uh-oh. Cottontail's grandfather, Old Coyote, had warned him not to go out of the camp. Cottontail, as usual, did not mind. And his beautiful long tail was bitten off by a monster. Oh. Cottontail learned his lesson. From that day on, he did what his grandfather told him. But Cottontail had one more lesson to learn. One day, Cottontail's grandmother, Old Raven, took him to a gathering in a big village beside the Columbia River. Cottontail went hunting with the hunters. He went fishing with the fishermen. They killed many deer. They caught many salmon. All the animal people had a big feast. The animal people played many different games. They played hunting games and ball games. They played many running games. But their favorite game of all was the stick game. The stick game is a guessing game. The players choose sides and form teams. Each team takes a turn guessing where the two sets of guessing bones are hidden. Cottontail and his friends liked to play the game, but Cottontail always cheated. That's not good. Some of the animals at the gathering decided to play the stick game. First, they chose side. sides. Chipmunk, skunk, porcupine, and beaver sat on one side of the log. See him? Raccoon, robin, Cottontail, and squirrel sat on the other side of the log. Every time porcupine would guess, Cottontail would cheat. He would switch the bones when Porcupine was not looking. That's not good, is it? Porcupine decided it was time to teach Cottontail a lesson. Whether it was time for his side to hide the bone, por when it whenever it was time for his side to hide the bone, Porcupine would sing his thunder gambling song. As Porcupine sang his song, big strikes, streaks of lightning would strike from the sky. The game went on. The bones went to Cottontail's side. Porcupine, watching Cottontail very closely, guessed correctly. By switching the bones, Cottontail cheated again. But Porcupine's thunder song worked. As Cottontail started to open his hands, the lightning flashed out of the sky and burned off his fingers. Oh! <gasps> And so it was. Cottontail learned another lesson. It is not fun to play with people who cheat. Cheating is bad. That is why, to this day, the Cottontail rabbit has paws instead of fingers. So there you go, uh, my friends. Thank you for tuning in and taking time out of your day to hear some traditional stories. Uh, from the Pacific Northwest, and we sure thank you for joining in with Native Wellness Institute. Again, I'm Renee Romanose. I'm Cheyenne from Oklahoma, and I'm honored and privileged to spend some time with you, and I hope that you look for my book, Sweetgrass Talking, available at Amazon and utteredchaospress.org, utter, utteredchaos.org, uh, also available from Barnes & Noble, as well as my um, upcoming book that should be coming out later this year called Have War Paint Will Travel. So um, stay safe, use safe practices, stay home, save lives. Thank you for tuning in.
and on behalf of Native Wellness Institute, we wish you well, we wish you good health, and we wish you a good day.